Chapter 3 Feculent Waters I was banging trouble. I'd had to avoid a police launch. It were either that or Changi Nick. They'd still got my passport in Singapore. Those cheeky gooks had confiscated it. Little chance of making it anywhere now, even if I had the money. If I'd been back in the UK, I'd have put the feelers out with my old pals are standing. Dennis from up on the heath or Alex down in the big smoke, and maybe got myself a snide. But by now, they too would be glad I was fucking stranded. I needed a plan. I knew a little about the geography of the Straits from a course I'd done back in Durham Nick that, coupled with the few books I'd read, had given me a starting point to formulate my escape. I knew it was possible to get over to mainland Malaysia from Singapore across the Straits of Johor. No one had ever done it before, but I had, in my dreams, a thousand times from my bunk on B-Wing in Walton Jail. Spanning about three quarters of a mile, the Straits were more than doable for a prime Paul Sykes. It wasn't the done thing, I'm sure, but desperate times call for desperate measures. I was all out of options, and invariably I was going to have to swim it. The strait separates the Malaysian state of Johor on the mainland Malay Peninsula to the north from Singapore and its islands to the south, usually only crossed by ferry. There was also a bridge known simply as the Causeway, which linked Johor Bahru and the woodlands in Singapore. Those weren't options to me, especially without a passport. They were no doubt manned up to the hilt to allow selective entry and exit, but not set up for the likes of me. I was a new one on this shower. I'd read in the Telegraph that this area of the Straits had become a source of contention between Malaysia and Singapore, but neither of them would want me as the problem if they knew what was good for them. The distance, assuming you're a decent swimmer and can complete the basic swim section of a triathlon, shouldn't be a problem. No one had ever swum it before, not because of the currents or anything like that, nothing like that. It's... Sharks. Not shark infested, but... None of the locals go paddling. That coupled with the frequent border patrols meant I'd have to be swift. I was still in good shape and knew I was more of an athlete than any of these little locals. I was twice the height of most of these eastern midgets. Just because they hadn't swum it, what the fuck did that mean? None of these little nips had swum Rail Reservoir. That didn't mean they couldn't do it. I'd done plenty of swimming in the hospital pool as part of my physiotherapy when I'd been in there for recovery from the Neville Mead incident. I'd followed the street signs through the town of Bugis in the direction of the Lido, the only section of beach deemed inhabitable to the locals and the only bit they wanted the tourists to see. In reality, it was a section of water as feculent as the paddling area at Hemsworth Water Park. I marched through the market line streets. Some of the alleyways were so dense with stock that the sunlight couldn't penetrate, and to make progress without injury I had to dodge and weave and be alert at all times, the market traders were seeking my head like tracer bullets. Risking life and limb, I crossed a couple of the busier roads, ones that looked like they were built for skateboards, but with five times more passing traffic than the M1. These little slants better make the most of it. Petrol runs out in 2019, you could see that for yourself. Must have only cost pennies per gallon round here the way they were pissing it away. They'd run out by the year 2000. Silly cunts. The vehicles that inhabited the streets were all tied up with wire and dropping to bits like a cancerous old screw. My old pal Mick would have loved to keep this place ticking over. He'd have made a killing over here, I thought. The heat was beginning to get the better of me. I waited across the road, away from the bustle of the trade zones, to regain my composure and gather my wits. I'd lost my way temporarily in the alleyways on a couple of occasions. They all looked alike. Each street, though buzzing with activity, had no real distinguishing features from the last. Looking at the fabrics and colours on display, they weren't what I'd imagined I'd find over here. All lovets and browns, miserable colours, much like the mood I was currently in. I'd given up scrutinising the street signs and marched forward as the crow flies in the general direction of the Causeway Bridge. I could already see it on the skyline. I didn't intend to cross too close to it, but it was the best indicator I had. Jumping makeshift ditches and hurdling fences in a beeline for my destination, 
In my mind, I was back in Fleetwood training again. What I wouldn't give for a handful of Dr. McGill's little green pills right now to take away the madness. I was the only white man to pass through these streets in the last decade, or so it felt, the bemused looks confirming it. A stranger in a far-off land, they wouldn't understand a single word of my Yorkshire dialect. It'd be beyond futile attempting to get any sense out of this lot. Not in the slightest did my current predicament worry me, but the fact that I was growing steadily weaker from the midday sun did. I wasn't half the man I was when I'd first arrived over here. I needed to snap out of it, get back on track. I had little chance of conquering the straits if my mind wasn't there, never mind my body. I'd managed to settle my nerve and decided to pay no mind to my surroundings. All around me local business owners flaunted their wares. Their offspring and random species of animal, some for sale, children and animals, some roaming stray and some chained up, children and animals. Their yelps, squawks, grunts and barks adding to the volume of the streets. The place was abuzz with the latent noise of people trying to earn a crust, no different to Wakefield Market on a Thursday dinner time. Even the lame dogs by the side of the road were holding their breath and staring in awe at the Yorkshiremen wandering through the markets of Bugis. Strangers glanced contemptuously as they passed me, curious glances. What was this knuckle-dragging beast marauding through their beloved town? The military wouldn't be far behind to sedate and shackle me, string me up and make a spectacle of me in the town square, selling tickets at two dollars a pop. Growing ever conscious of my appearance in dialect drawing unwanted attention, I kept my mouth firmly shut. The locals I could deal with, but I didn't want to see a copper again today. It'd spoil everything. It'd be worse than seeing a magpie. I'd had enough lawmakers in my life. By the time I'd arrived at the Lido, I was sweating like a white pea passing through the special unit in Hull Nick. I'd made it the full distance through the town of Bedock and arrived at the Lido alive. That was all I could ask for at this point. There were numerous restaurants and food stores lining the beachfront. Some extravagant, some not, but all about as much use as a one-legged man in an arse-kicking contest to a man with fuck-all money. Oh, how I craved the Townley Road chip shop one last time, a place I normally had no time for. I was starving, but if I was going to eat, it'd have to be table scraps. I'd have to compete with the local strays, grab a discarded chicken leg or a dog's wing. The heat was beginning to muddle my brain. I'd have to run for the hills like the local beggar kids did, the biggest little beggar Singapore had ever seen. Normally I'd have been able to switch on the intimidation tactics, or Yorkshire charm as I like to call it, and blag something. But there was too much heat on me. A six foot three eighteen stone Yorkshireman on the streets of Bedock stood out like a black man in the working men's clubs of Grimethorpe. The wondrous sight of the Lido brought an air of joy once again to my person. The fresh air was wonderful, the perfume from the odd tree, the silence. There wasn't any traffic for miles, it seemed, and the bounce in my step was wonderful again. The water was as green and mirror-like as the eyes of Medusa. Not a ripple broke its surface. Who was I kidding? My optimism had tainted my brain. The straits were polluted no less than the Osset sewage network, and it began to make me heave. I'd lost a lot of fluids on the march across town, but I was more than ready for the task ahead. To put it in pugilistic terms, I was still only three rounds in. I cupped a great handful of the water and necked it down. I knew the pollution along the straits was notable from an old telegraph article I'd read on my bunk, that along with the smell. Years of prison snap had made me immune to shit like that. My thirst had to be quenched, and I was fueling myself ready for the swim. I took off my pumps and tied them in an Ashley stopper knot around my neck, one used by the maritime adventurers of old, and one that wasn't coming undone under any circumstances. Another trick I'd learned in the nick. In fact, I'd once taught it to a con who'd wanted to top himself. I didn't want the poor bastard to fuck it up and end up brain damaged, so I did the decent thing and showed him how it was done. I owed Ashley Stopper a pint or two, and so did he. I dumped my clobber on the coarse sands and stripped down to the least I could to make the swim easier 
but leaving on enough that I could walk the Malayan streets at the other side with some dignity and avoid getting nicked again. My trusty gym shorts, vest and pumps, garments only essential to the task at hand, the same ones that had seen me through several heavy prison sentences. I sat on the far banks of the Lido behind a small, scruffy beach hut constructed from driftwood and burlap, watching a flock of wimbrels dive-bomb for discarded fish and viceroy tabends. I gathered my thoughts and wished I could swap places with them. The view was breathtaking, as would be the swim, literally. I had the beginning of a trickle of sweat forming at the bottom of my back. The heat was more intense than I'd first realised. My eyes blinded by a kaleidoscope of colours emanating from a million tiny spotlights dancing from the sun's rays. Then instantly, everything was knocked back into focus. I'd sat down to let my reserves replenish for the task ahead. Not because of any deliberation with my inner demons. Lord knows I had plenty of those. My old pal Mick's wife, Janet, had once said my brain had a thousand and one compartments with different and evil thoughts in each one. And if I was honest with myself, I couldn't disagree. My body was rested for now, but my mind went into third gear. I began to think about how the fuck I'd ended up here, and how the fuck I was going to get back to some kind of normality. You couldn't make up the shit, the twists and the turns that my life had taken. A black sheet had descended. My thoughts had been so rapid of late I'd not been able to analyse them. I had now and what I'd been wanting was to put the clock back to when I was 17 and starting out on life's romantic road. I'd missed out on growing up in so many ways. Life in the last few months had zipped by like a needle skidding across a record in a tumble of events and incidents too numerous to mention, and now, of all times, I'd finally found time to assess things. Everything in my life had happened too quickly. The speed and rush, the people and events like playing chess, doing a crossword, running a marathon, juggling Indian clubs and making love all at the same time. My brain flitted from one incident to another like the bees went from flower to flower, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't stop them. There was a reel of memories running before my eyes. Here on this desolate section of beach, I had the chance to analyse my feelings free of all pressure and outside influence. I was about to put my neck in the noose with the hope of pulling it back out again and I wanted to make sure I could face the consequences if I got caught in it. Maybe Changi Nick was the better option. It was a miserable day, a wind with the edge of a bread knife and freezing cold drizzly showers when I'd left. No wonder I'd been so eager to flee to the sun. My mood lightened temporarily as I thought back to the madness that had taken place in the process of rounding up the cash to make my trip. You really couldn't begin to make the events of my life up. 